In the entirety of human history, only four nations have ever achieved a true lunar landing. To join that elite club, it's no easy task. Many nations and even some private companies have tried, and the vast majority, even return missions by nations that have already done it, have failed decisively. It's a critical step for any nation that aspires to space flight, either for reasons of exploration or to go prospecting among the incredible natural resources of the cosmos, and yet it does remain rather elusive. Over the next few years, over 100 private companies and national governments across the world will attempt lunar landings. But the United States, China, the Soviet Union, and India are the only nations thus far that have ever broken through the barrier. All that is until last week, when that ultra-exclusive club of four got a new addition, Japan. In the early days of 2024, Japan's lunar lander found its way to lunar orbit, and then to lunar descent, and then to lunar touchdown in one of the most impressive feats that the nation of Japan has ever accomplished. But there's a caveat in Japan's groundbreaking achievements, one that might cause the achievement to have little practical value at all. The land you see is powered down and out of contact, and whether it ever wakes up again is entirely beyond Tokyo's control. For an object that's meant to carry the hopes and dreams of an entire nation on its back, Japan's lunar lander looks awfully unassuming. With dimensions of just 1.5 meters long by 1.5 meters wide and 2 meters tall, or 5 by 5 by 6.5 feet, the lander is small enough that it could be wedged into the back of your average SUV, and at a total mass of 590 kilograms at the time of launch, or 1,300 pounds, it's no heavier than your average subarctic bull elk. But inside those little dimensions is a whole lot of kit, and the potential to bring all of Japan some pretty incredible accolades. Its name is the Smart Lander for Investigating Moon, or SLIM. And of all the lunar landers that exist or have ever existed, SLIM is pretty impressive. Equipped with thin film solar cells and lithium ion batteries to allow it to survive on the lunar surface, SLIM is packing two ceramic engines to power it through orbit maneuvers, each capable of producing 500 newtons, or 112 pound force of thrust, as well as 12 much smaller 22 newton, roughly 5 pound force thrusters to control its attitude and help guide it to the lunar surface. It carries a multi-band camera for mineralogical exploration, a laser retro-reflector array to mark its landing position, and a crushable set of landing gear that's meant to absorb any potential problematic impact from a harder-than-expected landing. But the thing that really sets SLIM apart is its optical navigation system, an instrument so precise that it's earned Slim the informal name of Moon Sniper. The navigation system is loaded with maps that were constructed from data beamed back to Earth by a different Japanese lunar mission, the Cayuga Orbiter, and the Slim Lander is equipped to be able to match what it sees during its descent with parts of the map in order to guide itself down in a safe landing area. This process is completely autonomous, relying on unique image processing algorithms, and it's helped along by a landing radar that helps track proximity to the ground. The lander is thus able to touch down on the moon's surface with a stunning level of precision, with an accuracy within just 100 meters or 330 feet. For contrast, the Apollo 11 landing in 1969 was only able to guarantee that it would land somewhere in an area 20 kilometers or 12 miles long by 5 kilometers or 3 miles wide. Once SLIM landed on the lunar surface, it was expected to search for the mineral olivine at a site called Shioli Impact Crater, located within the moon's Mare Nectaris, or Sea of Nectar. The olivine mineral is believed to have been ejected from within the moon's mantle at some early stage of its evolution, suggesting that by studying it now, the SLIM lander can help to determine just how the moon was formed and how it evolved over time. Also riding on board were two lunar landers, each with some pretty cool attributes of their own. The first, Lunar Excursion Vehicle 1, is built to hop across the moon, which already might make it the best lunar rover ever, and it's able to communicate back and forth directly with Earth while watching its surroundings with wide-angle cameras and taking measurements for temperature, radiation, and incline of the slopes it's going to explore. The other lander, Lunar Excursion Vehicle 2, is a sphere about the size of a baseball, but it's not built to stay intact. Instead, its two halves are meant to separate, revealing two cameras and a stabilizer inside. This rover can basically run across the surface of the moon, using its two halves to heave itself left and right in a process we sincerely hope is adapted into some Baywatch memes. As for SLIM itself, its lifespan is meant to last just one single lunar day, roughly as long as a month here on Earth because of its lack of self-heating units to ward off the incredible cold of lunar night. SLIM was commissioned by the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, better known as JAXA, in a process that dates all the way back to 2005 and really got underway in 2015. Constructed by Mitsubishi Electric, SLIM was actually meant to be the second lunar lander in Japan's history, but its predecessor, a cube satellite lander, was unable to keep its solar cells facing toward the sun. 
Instead, it was Slim who'd get the nod at a total development price of 18 billion yen or $121.5 million. Slim would ride into orbit on the back of a H-2A expendable launch system constructed by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, a tried and true method of launching satellites into orbit. The H-2A has carried a prior Japanese Venus orbiter into space, as well as a Mars probe built by the United Arab Emirates that still orbits the Red Planet today. The two-stage H-2A can carry a payload far above the weight of the Slim lander, and standing at a height of 53 meters and producing up to 247,000 pounds thrust of force with its first stage, it's a pretty serious rocket. Because of all the extra payload space, Slim would ride to space with a buddy, the X-ray Imaging and Spectroscopy Mission, which is a joint venture between JAXA and NASA that successfully placed a new X-ray observatory into space. That mission's actually a pretty cool one too, so do let us know if you like a video on that. Like any lunar lander, Slim would have not one, but two candidates for the biggest day of its life, the day it launched into orbit and the day it touched down on the lunar surface. In Slim's case, that first biggest day would arrive on the 6th of September 2023, where tucked in next to its X-ray observing best buddy, it was launched from the Tangashima spaceport on Japan's island of Kyushu. It was carried into low Earth orbit and placed on a trajectory that would allow the rocket's other payload to be dropped off. But when they arrived at the rendezvous point, Slim bid the X-ray imaging and spectroscopy mission goodbye in the only way two machines can say farewell. That is, by sitting cold and motionless next to each other, fulfilling their mission protocols with zero idea of each other's existence and never interacting at all. Then, with that touching moment complete, Slim was raised into a higher orbit and prepared for what's called a translunar injection burn. That is, the expenditure of burned fuel that would put it on on the right trajectory to cross paths with the moon as the moon continued its own orbit around the earth the earth around the sun and the sun around the center of the milky way basically it's a really complicated piece of maths but japan got it just right on october the 4th slim made its first lunar flyby and was finally in business slim's path to actually reach the lunar surface was a little bit unusual now usually a spacecraft trying to stay in lunar orbit rather than just flying by would need to execute a pretty large fuel burn in order to break itself but japan didn't want to do that so they didn't. Instead, Slim flew way beyond the moon after its first flyby, heaved way out into deep space on a trajectory that Jackson knew would eventually pull it into a long, looping lunar orbit. From there, Slim would be dragged back toward the moon without any fuel burns at all. Again, Japan's maths proved to be correct, and their patient strategy won the day. By late December 2023, Slim was able to perform a much smaller braking burn and insert itself in close lunar orbit as expected. Again, JAXA appeared to be in no hurry in getting to the lunar surface. Over the next month, Slim would circle the moon again and again, giving the JAXA team all the time they needed to make calculations, tweak the probe's trajectory, and prepare for a landing that gave them the best possible chance of success. As we previously described, it is very hard to pull off a successful moon landing, and JAXA wasn't about to fail on its first attempt. On the 19th of January, the moment arrived for the moon sniper to home in on its target of the Sea of Nectar. And after a slow, soft, and extremely precise landing process, Slim did it. Hovering immediately before touchdown, Slim dropped its two rovers far enough away that they wouldn't be crushed, and then Slim itself made the drop. Its crushable landing gear worked as planned, touching first with its rear elements, then allowing them and the probe's underbelly to gently crush inward and absorb force as the front legs touched gently to the ground. Slim began beaming back signals to Earth using its internal battery, and mission control at JAXA had, as far as we can tell from YouTube clips, a pretty muted celebration, but a celebration nonetheless. Japan had done it. Except there was a small problem, and it wasn't going to stay small for very long. During the landing, a technical issue had caused slim solar cells to be facing westward, which, when it comes to lunar day, turns out to be a pretty major problem. The issue at hand is that on the moon, like on planet Earth, the sun rises from the east, and because of the way slim solar cells were aligned, they weren't going to be able to collect any meaningful level of solar power until much later in the lunar day than anticipated. And, if you remember, this lunar lander was projected to survive for just one lunar day in total, and that was for reasons unrelated to whether it had enough charge in its battery. The intense cold of lunar night is expected to wreck the lander's internal systems, no matter what. And it doesn't matter how charged Slim's battery is, because even with full charge, Slim has no heating units for those batteries to power in the first place. Now, we should be clear here and point out that even though this issue does put a major damper on Japan's achievement, it doesn't undo what Japan's already accomplished. JAXA did land Slim on the moon, they did achieve a so-called soft landing, and Slim demonstrated that it was perfectly able to fulfill its mission functions once it touched down. Slim was able to beam back technical data as well as images, both from the descent and from the landing, and none of its instruments are believed to have been damaged in the landing. 
The only issue, of course, was that now it was expected to run out of power sooner rather than later. So Jackson made the pragmatic choice. Slim was powered down with 12% of battery charge remaining in order to ensure that the battery wouldn't over-discharge and become unable to restart the lander, even with the addition of solar energy. Jaxa has been very clear that although the current status of the Slim Lander falls a bit short of their platonic ideal, it still has a good chance of recovery. But optimistic or not, it's still a matter of both when that recovery might happen and whether it'll happen at all. Right now, Jaxa and the Slim Lander are in a waiting game, in which they'll only be able to start gathering power at all when the sun's rays eventually crest over the obstructing angle of the Slim solar cells and start beaming down onto the energy collecting surface. So far as we in the public are aware, Jaxa Jaxa doesn't know the precise angle of the solar cells right now, and it's a factor that's going to determine how effective a solar power recharge is going to be. In a best case scenario, the panels are oriented in a way that would allow them to soak up a full blast of sunlight later in the lunar day, at least allowing Jaxa to get a few Earth days of data before Slim falls silent for good. In a worst case scenario, the solar cells are facing in a direction that will only give them minimal exposure to direct sunlight, even when the sun moves through the lunar sky. This means that any charge they do collect will take a while to build up and may or may not be enough to justify booting up the lander again. Regardless, Jax's only job now is to wait and see if the lander is able to begin gathering power and boot itself back up. Luckily, we won't be completely without Slim Lander news until then. The two rovers Slim released are believed to be doing just fine, hopping and running across the lunar surface and taking pictures that they'll slowly beam back to Earth. Hopefully, those pictures will also show the Slim Lander itself, allowing JAXA to get more information and make precise projections about just how much lunar energy it will be able to collect. No doubt, somebody or a group of somebodies over at JAXA are working hard writing out their list of mission goals and objectives in the event that Slim does turn back on, and they'll be able to complete a mad dash to collect maximal amounts of data before the probe is lost forever. Nevertheless, the waiting game continues. If Slim can't collect enough solar energy to be able to turn itself back on during this lunar day cycle, then it's probably never going to be able to turn back on. Lunar day and night, of course, are pretty consistent, and so is the angle of the sun relative to the lunar surface, so whatever the ability of those solar cells to collect energy ends up being, that's probably what JAXA is going to be stuck with. But if Slim does manage to collect enough energy to fulfill a few days of mission functions, then the next question, however predetermined its answer might seem, is whether the lander can survive lunar night. This is a brutal affair for any visitor to the moon, mechanical or human, with temperatures reaching as low as negative 180 degrees Celsius or minus 292 Fahrenheit. That's a good way off from absolute zero, but in scientific terms, it's known as absolutely bloody freezing. By Jax's own measurements, that should be enough to render Slim inoperable permanently. However, this would not be the first time that an extraterrestrial lander like Slim has proven capable of feats of survival that its handlers thought impossible. For example, the Spirit and Opportunity rovers on Mars were meant to survive just 90 Martian days, but they both lasted for thousands of days, with Opportunity surviving 15 Earth years. Perhaps Slim can pull off a similar feat, and while the odds are firmly against it, we simply won't know until we get there. But even more important than Slim's potential resuscitation is the impact that this humble little lander will have on both the Japanese space program and on the future of extraterrestrial exploration as a whole. The full range of data beamed back to Earth about Slim's landing will take a full month to analyze, but when those figures are finally available, they'll reveal just how precise Slim's landing ultimately was. With luck, that data will confirm that Slim's onboard technology worked, and that these sorts of autonomous, precise lunar landings are really possible with current technology. Prove that, and the same technology that brought Slim to the lunar surface will be able to guide future landers into craters and other interesting locations, rather than sequestering them to flat planes where there's less risk of destruction during the landing process. And that won't just be true on the moon either. With technology like Slim's precise landings on Mars, or potential other exploratory missions like Ceres or Mercury, or even asteroids, it will become a whole lot more feasible. And as always, there's the incredible public impact of a lander like Slim, regardless of how well things go on the lunar surface once it touches down. The Slim touchdown captured the attention of the nation of Japan, inspiring support for future missions like it, and inspiring curiosity for the next generation of space voyagers who learned about Slim in classrooms across the world. With Slim's success, and indeed Slim was a major success, Japan has conclusively joined one of Earth's most elite spacefaring clubs and gotten out ahead of a wave of lunar exploration that's set to intensify over the next few years. With Japan a step ahead, and more better Japanese lunar landers well on their way, Slim will pave the way for generations of space missions to come, even as it waits, silent, on the surface of the moon, weathering a long lunar night from which it may never return.